So it is that time. It's time that we talk about all the books that I closed out the year with in the month of December. And the month of December was kind of a free-for-all of where I read whatever the heck it felt like because the two prior months I had done readathons, which I just pretty much read in the vein of what the readathons were. So this month I read fiction, nonfiction, fantasy, horror, just kind of a crazy variety of books that were all over the place. And it was a moody reading month and it was great. The first thing that I read was The Echo of Old Books by Barbara Davis. And this book was about this woman who owned a used and rare bookshop. And she comes across this unique book. It's bound really beautifully. And it's a story of, it seems like these star-crossed lovers. There's no author to the book. And she's starting to think that maybe the story within may be a true story. As the story goes on, it turns out there's another book that is bound very similar to this one, and it's a response to this book. So that makes the mystery go further. As her curiosity is piqued, she starts digging to find out who these people were, and it's kind of a tragic love story of what happened. And it turns out that it is a true story, and you go along on this journey to find out if these people are still alive and what happened and there's all this crazy drama with the family and it was just a really good strange and heartwarming story the next book i read was a manga and that was hashtag dracul or d-r-c-l the midnight children volume one it's based on bram stoker's dracula the artwork's absolutely beautiful but the story flow, the way that it's in this book, didn't flow very well and it seemed hazy and like pieces of it were missing and it was just very odd, almost like a dream. And so if it was supposed to come across as like this hazy vampiric dream, then they did that well, but I didn't quite enjoy my time because of how there wasn't really a flow. And there's so much that seemed like was missing in the plot points of the story. So that was kind of disappointing, but the artwork was beautiful. The story was all right. I just, it would have been better if the flow had been better, but you know what? Not every book is for me. So I guess maybe just that one wasn't for me. I don't believe I will get further into that series. Next up we have Where He Can't Find You by Darcy Coates. And this is a horror thriller. And it follows the story of these teens and this town. And this town has a strange, weird secret. And there is this like killer that's attached to the town. And some people think it's a monster. Some people think it's a man. They call him the Stitcher. People are taken and they disappear. And then when they reappear, they're not alive. They're dead. They'll have their limbs are not where they're supposed to be. They'll be sewn in strange places like a hand on the head or a foot where the wrist should be and just real effed up stuff and sometimes it's like other people's body pieces and when someone's about to be taken this is why people think it might be a monster or something strange and paranormal stuff goes kind of whack like cell phones don't work right they get all glitchy televisions are like between channels and stuff gets all weird and effed up and the animals behave all weird and there's all these animals in the area that have like tumors and they're born without like limbs and just weird creepy stuff and i love darcy coats it was fast paced it was intense and it was just a really great horror thriller and i had a lot of fun with that one next we got into an indie horror book called apparitions by adam pottle and this is told from the perspective of someone who is completely deaf. And the author himself is also deaf. So the way that he describes it and shows you this picture of it is very authentic. And it's such a heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, emotional story. It's horror, and there's a lot of darkness in it, but there's also some glimpses of light. Fowl's the main character. He was taken from his mom when he was young by his father and he's only known violence from his father's hand for most of his life. And so his dad took him and threw him in this basement and he's been locked down there for a long time. And then at some point, real effed up situation happens and he escapes. And so he escapes and he goes and ends up in this institution, like a sanitarium. 
he ends up making friends with this other deaf boy who teaches him sign language and gives him language and frees him from his internal prison because he never learned how to sign or to speak or how to do any of that. And so that frees him in a way. And, you know, he's never felt love. And so he gets some glimpses of love and what that possibly might be like, except for everything takes a very dark turn and twist towards the end. But it's such a powerful, moving story, and I would highly recommend it. It's just, man, it's gut-wrenching, but it is so freaking good. Also, I will have links to all these books down below if you're interested in any of those. Those are affiliate links, which is a great way to support the channel and also to support indie bookstores. Next up, we have Mr. Magic by Kirsten White. I loved this book. It's so freaking weird and so good. So there's this TV show that maybe existed or maybe it didn't. People think it did. There's all these Reddit forums about this show called Mr. Magic that seemed to exist when they were kids. But no one can find any information on where it was filmed, who produced it, anything about when it was on or all of this stuff. And some people have memory of it ending because something really effed up happened that ended the show that was possibly pretty terrifying. Did this show actually exist? Well, maybe. <laughs> so there's characters. They are the kids now grown as adults in their late 30s that used to be on the show. And they're contacted to come do this reunion podcast to tell the story. And they go back to this house and stay in this house where their families used to stay when they were filming the show. The main character, she had left the show. Her dad had taken her away and hid her away for all these years, but she doesn't even remember that she was on it and like has no memory. And so when she meets these people again who used to be on the show with her, she in her body and soul like knows that she knows them, but she doesn't remember them. And so she's kind of coming into this and trying to figure out what's this all about and what's going on. And all these people, all they really remember is the happiest they ever were was when they were in this show and filming. And they've been chasing that their whole lives. And it kind of, you know, effed up their lives and how they live them and whatnot. And so they all come together. But who called them there? Who brought them to do this podcast? Who is behind all this? Is it a trap? It's probably a trap. It's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap. Run. Run away, everybody. It's so good. It's so weird as you find out like what happened and like what happened on the show, why it ended. It's pretty effed up. It's weird and emotional and just really messed up strange horror. After that, we have the nonfiction book Encounters by D.W. Pasalka. This book is about people who've had experiences with non-human entities that could possibly be extraterrestrial or aliens and what have you and just the different ways that this can be experienced whether it's through dreams or technology or ai and it's really weird and interesting i read this book in a couple of days and it gets into just a lot of like kind of out there and very fascinating subject matter and if you have any interest in the paranormal and possible life outside of you know the normal <laughs> existence, non-human entities, possibly extraterrestrial encounters was quite the fascinating read. After that, I read the book Be Useful, Seven Tools for Life by Arnold Schwarzenegger. I picked up this book because I like inspirational books. I am a fan of them. I had listened to Rick Rubin's Tetragrammatron podcast and he had Arnold Schwarzenegger on talking about his book and it really intrigued me and I went out and got it. It's absolutely fantastic. It's basically steps that anybody can put into practice just to work towards your goals of what you want to do in life. Like, you know, your dreams, what do you aspire to and how you can get there? And you start slow and you build on it and work towards that. And I thought it was pretty great. I have a standalone review for that book that I will link down below if you're interested in checking that out. Any of the books that I have standalone reviews for, those will also be down in the darkness, in the description. So feel free to check those out. Then after that, we read an indie horror book called Mothman Haze by E.C. Hansen. And if you've been around the channel, you may know I love cryptids, but especially I love Mothman. You might be able to even see him over my shoulder. Oh, can I point to him? He's right there. There's a stuffed Mothman right there. And then there's like, there's smaller. I'm trying to 
like look at my camera up there there's like a little one too you give me a book that's about mothman i'm probably gonna want to read it so this is a short little horror novella and the story is about this girl and her nephew who was kidnapped and her dad thinks that he saw mothman kidnap the nephew and so oh, the story is super weird and they're trying to determine did this winged creature kidnap her nephew or was it a normal kidnapping you know like did the, the father possibly kidnap him or was it just some random kidnapper or was it really mothman it's sad it's emotional there's some dark humor in it as well and the main character is very horny just saying the ending is just kind of gut-wrenching and uh yeah I, I highly enjoyed it after that we got into a little bit of fantasy and it was a fairy tale retelling kind of story called after the forest by kel woods the story follows the characters greta and hans so right away you may notice hansel and gretel so it's part hansel and gretel part snow white and a little bit of peter and the wolf and it's witchy it's magical and just a fantastic retelling. I really enjoyed my time in this one. Hans, he's a gambler and he owes money all over town. And so now they are faced with possibly losing their house. With the backstory and their history of how they were taken by this weird witch back in the day with her gingerbread house and everybody thinks that Greta pushed her into an oven. Well, we're not sure what Greta doesn't really remember and all of that stuff. So they kind of think that Greta herself is a witch and weird stuff happened when she was a kid and they blamed her. So they think she's kind of witchy and all that. And so anyway, gambling debt, right? So she has to figure out how they're gonna pay this gambling debt. On top of that, some effed up stuff starts happening where people may start calling her a witch and blaming her as possibly being a witch. So then she's gotta try to dispel that as well. Stuff gets crazy. It's a wild story and it was a really fun fantasy. It was dark and magical. And I have a standalone review for that one too. So that'll also be down. Okay, then we read a crazy haunted house story. The September House by Marissa Orlando. Holy bananas! This story... Well, first of all, I love a good haunted house story, but the second I started reading this, it's so, like, it pulls you in, but it's so neurotic. Like, you're in the neurotic mind of the main character. <laughs> so, this couple, Margaret and Hal, they buy this old Victorian house and it's absolutely beautiful. It's like their dream house. They've never owned a house before, so they're super excited about this. The real estate agent is like, hey, gotta disclose to you, someone was murdered here, this happened, and they're only half paying attention. They're like, oh yeah, well, you know, stuff happens, this, that, and the other. And then the real estate kind of mumbles and you know, uh, all the other deaths that happened, they were natural causes. <laughs> yep, natural causes, that's right. And they're just totally not paying attention to what she's saying because they're so enthralled with this house. And the only weird vibes they get is when they go in the basement. And they get some bad vibes from the basement. But as soon as they're back upstairs, Bad vibes are gone. They don't even think about it. They buy the house. Everything is fine. Everything's wonderful. They've been remodeling it, just decorating it, making it their own. And then September comes around. Oh, when the walls start bleeding. <laughs> and then the dead children show up. Some are missing limbs. Others will bite you if you get too close. And what's in the basement? Nothing good is the basement, I promise. And it's such a crazy haunted house story. I thought it was good and I liked it quite a bit. And you know, for me, it was going to be a four star read. And four is a great read. If I, four stars, great read. But the ending bumped it up to five. The ending is so just insane. And it's so good. I loved it. If you like haunted house stories, the September house, you might really enjoy the insanity of it. Then after that, because I wanted to read something that was a little bit, you know, for the season of December, I read Krampus by Brahm. And this is the second Brahm book I've read. I need to read more by Brahm because Krampus is absolutely fantastic. And I think it might be my new favorite seasonal read for the Yuletide. I loved in this how Norse mythology was totally interwoven with it. Like it's kind of Santa Claus versus Krampus. And Santa had basically had Krampus like locked up 
for I think it was like 500 years. He was shackled in this cave. Krampus has these servants and they're all Belschnickels, right? He claims them, he has his claim on them, so they're kind of shackled to him. Not like they have to stay in the cave and whatnot, but they're his, his servants. And Santa seems to be a character from Norse mythology. I don't really want to give it away because I thought it was so cool who he ended up being. I've always loved mythology, whether it's Norse or Greek or Japanese, just like the strange lore of it all. So having all that lore in this just made the story so rich and so fantastical. It's so good. This is, yeah, like I said, my new favorite holiday read. Krampus by Brahm. Absolutely fantastic. Now we need to figure out what Brahm book I'm going to read next. Someone in my comments on another video gave me a big list. Oh, I would probably pick one from there at some point and then uh, there'll be more Brahm in the future because holy bananas. Also, Brahm is an amazing artist. I don't know if you've ever seen the artwork that he does. It's awesome. So after that, we read The Star and the Strange Moon by Constance Sayers. And this book is about a haunted film or maybe a film straight from hell. We don't know. Well, I do know. I do. Obviously, I read the book. So I can't tell you. You got to read it to find out. I loved this book. It has two timelines that you kind of flip between. At first, you come into the story. There's this kid, Christopher, and his mom. And they live this kind of transient lifestyle. And Christopher is like 10. They pretty much live in motel rooms. His mom, she kind of drinks. And it seems like she pops pills. But... Currently, things are looking up. She just got a gig where she's going to go and sing and they're going to stay at this new motel for like a month or two. But he's also worried at the same time because now he's got to make friends with all the housekeepers and stuff because, you know, the ones at the prior motel or current one where he was staying, they all kind of took pity on him. And, you know, sometimes they give him toys that were left behind or some change so he could get food from the vending machine so he didn't starve and whatnot. And he was more of the adult than his mom was because he was kind of taking care of her. And so anyways, she gets this gig. They go to this new place and they're going down the hallway towards the room. And down the hall, there's all these pictures of all these old movie stars and stuff. And they come to this one picture of this old movie star, Gemma Turner. And the mom sees it and freaks the F. She grabs red nail polish out of her purse and like chucks it at it and just starts screaming and then rips it off the wall and just absolutely destroys it. And the kid's like, mom, <laughs> mom, we gotta, we gotta go. We gotta go to the room. Come on, let's go. Let's go. So he finally gets her to the room and then she goes comatose for like three days. Eventually the hotel people like get them out of the room. She's taken away in an ambulance and they're like, hey, you got any family? Do you have a dad or whatever? And he's like, no, no dad, but here's my aunt's number and all of that. So his aunt's husband comes and picks him up and also gets saddled with the bill for the destruction of this poster and stuff of Gemma Turner and the motel room and all of that. He pays it and the kid, he's like, sees the name Gemma Turner and he, his whole life now wonders why did his mother freak out? when she saw this woman's picture on the wall. Okay, so you have that. Then you have Gemma Turner, and it follows her life. And she's dating this rock star who seems like a whiny, possessive, manipulative piece of crap. She used to do all these surf films, and she was like the hotness and the hot star, and her star was rising, but then she wanted to like stretch her talent and do other stuff. So she took on a couple other films, and they were kind of flops, and then... She got blamed for a lot of the reason that they were flops, even though it was not really her fault. It was due to terrible editing and all this other stuff. But she gets the chance to go do this film with this French director, Thierry Valdon. And this is like her last chance. Or so her manager guy says. So she gets the part. It's for this weird vampire film. It's going to be a horror flick. And so she goes to do it. And 10 days into filming, she disappears. And she disappears on film. One minute she's there, and the next frame, she's gone. And so after a while, everybody thinks she's dead. But all of a sudden, this film resurfaces. After the director dies, every 10 years, this film is shown to a select group of people. And every 10 years, new footage is added that was not there before with Gemma Turner. And so people are like, this is impossible. It can't possibly be her. It has to be a double. It has to be something. And there's all these different weird theories about it. It's fantasy. It's horror. 
It is weird. There's some occult stuff going on. It's such a strange and liminal book. I loved it. It was so freaking good. I would highly recommend that. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. The Star and the Strange Moon by Constance Sayers. Check it out. If you are a fan of videos where I talk about multiple books that I am reading or have read, the next video coming up will be about that. So stick around, check it out. And if you had fun hanging out today, hit that subscribe button, come back, see me again, and we'll talk about more bookish things and weird stuff.